Before we begin developing a rigorous probability theory, we need some motivation for what probability is supposed to be. We often talk about experiments in probability, and it's certainly true that probability theory plays a key role in all of modern science. But really, the kinds of experiments we usually talk about are born out of gambling, because probability theory got its start in the gambling houses of the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. The most fundamental kind of experiment that we usually start motivating probability with is tossing a fair coin. That experiment has two outcomes, heads or tails. But we might be interested in more than tossing just one coin. We might be interested in tossing it a number of times. For example, four times. If I toss a fair coin four times, there are lots of possible outcomes. In fact, 16 possible outcomes. Here's one of them. I might get heads, tails, heads, heads. That's one outcome. But I might be interested not in just a single outcome, but in a collection of outcomes described in a nice way. For example, this is one outcome in the event that there were three heads and one tail. That is an event, which is not a single outcome in this experiment. It's actually a collection of four outcomes. Heads, 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 tails. Heads, heads, tails, heads. Heads, tails, heads, heads. And tails, heads, heads, heads. That's an event. Now, if I were going to try to calculate probabilities, we have some intuitive notion of how to do that in this case. There were 16 possible outcomes, and each outcome has equal likelihood. So the probability that this outcome occurred is 1 16th. The probability that this event occurred is 4 16ths, or 1 quarter. Discrete probability is more or less counting. Counting can be hard in certain problems, but there's nothing technically challenging about the mathematics underlying calculating those uniform discrete probabilities. But there are other experiments that can be conducted where the probabilities can't be computed just by counting. Another one comes from gambling houses, and that is throwing darts at a dartboard. In this case, we might be interested in the probability of hitting a bullseye. Now, a bullseye could be interpreted as the mathematical point at the center of the circle. In that case, the probability of actually hitting a bullseye would be zero. But really, the bullseye is a small but positive radius disk at the center. And so in this case, which is another example of a uniform probability measure, we would calculate the ratio of the area of the bullseye to the area of the whole disk to calculate that probability. But we might be interested in other kinds of events. For example, the event that we hit one of these red numbers. That event is a union of these nearly rectangular, circular sectors. So in general, we have experiments with outcomes, and we're interested in sets of outcomes, which are events. The collection of all outcomes is called the sample space, and is usually denoted by a capital Omega. Events are subsets of the sample space. Now thinking back to our motivating video from the Banach-Tarski paradox, if our sets, if our events are pretty simple things, like a disk or a collection of rectangles, there's probably not going to be any issue. But our event could, in principle, be a very strange nasty, foggy subset of this disk. And then we might run into strange paradoxical problems like we did in our motivating example. 
That's why we need to take special care and we need to develop our ideas from the get-go to be immune to those sorts of paradoxes. Now let's step back for a moment and remember what caused the apparent paradox. The problem arose from countable additivity. So why don't we just abandon that? Indeed, in the first example here, there are only finitely many outcomes. And so there's really no point in talking about countable unions of disjoint sets. In this example, on the other hand, we have no choice. But maybe we should just restrict our attention to problems where it doesn't come up. Well, here's the problem. It'll come up even in those. Here's an example, tossing a fair coin. Here's the experiment. I want to take my coin and toss it until tails comes up. Now that might just take one toss with probability one half, or it might take two tosses with probability one quarter, but there's really no way for me to know in advance how many tosses are going to be required to get the first tails. And so I'm in a bit of a pickle. I need to have a sample space that allows for an arbitrary number of tosses. The standard way we would model this experiment is by taking as the sample space the set of all countably infinite sequences of tosses. That is, where each term in the sequence is either a heads or tails. Now, the question that's being asked here is, if I keep tossing a coin until tails comes up, what's the probability that the total number of tosses until tails comes up was an odd number? So it was one toss, or three tosses, or five tosses, and so on. In this example here, I'm going to stop tossing once I reach tails, but the sample space contains continued sequences of tosses afterward. That's okay, we just ignore those when we're calculating probabilities. Now a little bit of useful notation here. Instead of writing these as sequences, we can recall that a sequence is just a function, and write this as the set of all functions, little omega, from the natural numbers, the indexing set, into the two element set, heads and tails. That's going to be our sample space. And now how do we describe the event that we're interested in calculating the probability of right here? Well, we can write it exactly the way I just said it out loud, which is to say that that event is a union. It's the union of the event that actually the first toss was tails, or the event that the first two tosses were heads and the third toss was tails, or the event that the first four tosses were heads and the fifth was tails, and so on. Because we don't know when we're going to stop, this event is an infinite union, a countably infinite union. We could write it more succinctly like this. Each of these can be described as the set of sequences omega where the first 2j tosses are heads, but the 2j plus 1th toss is tails. Now you'll notice that I've used this square u to indicate disjoint union. Indeed, these events are all disjoint from each other. If I have the first two tosses are heads, that's completely inconsistent with the first four tosses being heads, or the first toss being tails. All of these events have no outcomes in common with each other, so they are disjoint.
let's call them EJ. The event we're interested in, that the first tails toss occurs on an odd toss, that is a disjoint union of these events. Each of these events are the kinds of things that we can easily calculate the probability of from our discrete probability intuition. Indeed, the event EJ is the event that there are two J heads followed by a tails. That specifies two J plus one individual tosses. Each has probability one half. And so the probability of each one of those is two to the two J plus one inverse. Now, how does that help us here? We'd like to calculate the probability of the full event E. If this were a finite union, then our intuition tells us that the probability of a union must be the sum of the individual probabilities of disjoint events. I personally don't have much intuition about infinite unions, but if we make the assumption that that intuition also holds for countably infinite unions, then this probability should be the sum of the probabilities of those disjoint events in the union, which is the sum of one over two to the two j plus one. And if you work that out, you get two thirds. In this example, it was critical that our probability measure be assumed to be countably additive over disjoint unions of events. Without that assumption, we simply wouldn't be able to calculate this probability. Examples like this motivated the founders of probability theory over a hundred years ago to decide that countable additivity was a must have property for probability measures. But I don't wanna to lie to you. That was a controversial choice. It's become and quickly became the standard assumption, but there was dissent and continues to be dissent. And in fact, there is a lot of research in abstract mathematics about finitely additive probability measures, which are in fact much harder and more unwieldy to understand because you can't do calculations like this. This course is not going to talk about those at all we are going to make the standard assumption that probability measures are countably additive. And so now let's write down our putative definition of what a probability measure is. We start with a sample space, omega, like for example, the set of all sequences of heads or tails, or a radius R dartboard. A probability measure on that sample space is a function defined not on the sample space, but on events, on subsets of the sample space. Remember this notation two to the omega means the set of all subsets of omega. It's a function defined on subsets of omega, taking values in the interval from zero up to one. And it has these two properties. One, the probability of the entire sample space omega is one and two, or two prime to be consistent with the notation we used in the previous video. If I have a countably infinite sequence of mutually disjoint events, then the probability of their union is the sum of the probabilities. That is our putative definition of a probability measure. But we immediately know that that's not gonna cut it in some examples. In the coin tossing example, it turns out that everything that's written here is just fine. But in the example of tossing a dart at a dartboard, we may run into problems like we saw with the non-measurability of certain subsets of the circle. So we know we may have to replace the set of all events, the set of all subsets of the sample space with something smaller, a smaller collection of events that are easier to handle. But what kind of collection should we use? Well, to motivate that, which will be the topic of the next video, let's look again at some simple consequences of countable or even finite additivity. For example, 
If I take any event and look at its complement, also written as omega minus e, well, that's the set of all things that are not in e. And that means that if I take e and e complement, their union, which is a disjoint union, is all of omega. From that, we can see that the probability of this disjoint union is the probability of omega, which by property one is one. But by countable and therefore finite additivity of probability over disjoint unions, this is the sum of the probability of E and of E complement. And therefore, the probability of E complement is one minus the probability of E, one of the first day properties of probability in an undergraduate probability course. In particular, if we take E to be the full sample space omega, that says that the probability of the complement of the full sample space, which is the empty set, is one minus the probability of the full sample space, which is one, and that gives me zero. So that's another property that these probability measures must have. Now, the reason I included this calculation here is to tell us that whatever our reduced set of events should be, it better be closed under the kinds of operations that we're doing here. It had better contain the sample space. It had better contain the complement of the sample space. It had better contain the complement of any set that's in it. So it must be closed under complement. And it had better be closed under taking unions in order for us to do any of these calculations. Now, one might argue that it only needs to be closed under taking disjoint unions, but in the context of also being closed under complements, that will entail that it is closed under taking any unions. In fact, it will entail that it's closed under taking countable unions. And that will bring us to our next topic in the next video, sigma fields.